Well, Bill, Alex Harvey, he was fun. He, uh, he's a guy I met down uh, when I came saw you. We, we did that, that little road right. trip and got to spend a little time together. He's just one of the good ones. And, you know, the, it teaches me about the Southern traditions as, as you do. So it, it's so cool because we basically almost have the same background. I, I mean, he grew up in Mississippi on farms, hunting and fishing. I grew up in Tennessee on a farm, hunting and fishing, and ended up in the conservation arena. Um, so hearing about his background uh, and, and then about his work to try to help other folks in the South, you know, whether it's to get back into hunting or get involved in hunting or to help rural landowners uh, take advantage of, you know, or, or take advantage is the wrong word, but but avail themselves of the help that they can get um, that they just didn't know about. Yeah. And I, I mentioned it in the podcast, legacy, the word legacy. And every time I talk mm-hmm. to him, it's kind of like he has these like familial stories and then, you know, his work is to like improve habitat and get more people engaged and do all this stuff. And it really, it really does bring home that word. And he named his business that, and it's kind of like, right. that's what it's all about. You know, tell your stories, bring other people into the fold, help with conservation, help with habitat. I just really like talking to him because he just does all that so well. He's just a great emissary for it. He, he is. And we need more Alex's in the world. Um, we do. I, obviously we need new hunters. We need new blood. We need new people coming in, um, for just if, for nothing else, the conservation dollars they provide, but obviously there's so much more and, and people like Alex are the tip of the spear making that happen. And I can't get enough of all the little, you know, hunting culture is kind of the same in one way. Like you, you mm-hmm. get to talking to people and they, there's so many shared narratives, but then there's all these little folds and twists and plots and turns and nooks and crannies. <laughs> I just love that. And kind of no matter who I talk to, people who just hunt and fish and are passionate about it, there's always just these little nuances and great things that are fun to talk about that just really kind of pull at you. And, and you're like, oh, I want to know more about that. Well, you know, we, uh, we mentioned Holt Collier in the podcast. And I don't know if you've ever read Holt Collier. If you hadn't, I'll get you the book. But uh, Holt was the guide when the whole teddy bear episode went down. Hmm. He had captured this bear and was basically tied, staked it out to make it an easy kill. And Roosevelt refused to do it. And they ended up hunting together many times over the years. He even tried to get Holt to go with him to Africa on safaris. So, uh, uh that history is kind of cool in Mississippi with African Americans. Yeah, I, I mean, I know the cursory, like the you know the very short Cliff Notes version, but uh, you're right. I should I should read the longer version. Yeah, this would be a good spur to do it. Anyway, folks, go go check out this episode. Alex Harvey was our guest. You're gonna like this one. Since 1936, the National Wildlife Federation has worked with hunters and anglers to pass the most important conservation laws of American history and to protect our sporting traditions. This podcast explores our history, our values, and the work we do to safeguard the fish and wildlife that fuel our passions. We are NWF Outdoors. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the NWF Outdoors podcast here with my buddy and co-host, Bill Cooksey. What's happening, Big Bill? Aaron, what's up, man? All good in Tennessee. Good. And today uh, we are lucky to have yet another good guest, uh, a, a new friend of mine. We got to meet each other in December after I had learned a little bit about him, but we got to spend some time together. What's happening today, Alex? How you doing, man? How's it going? How are both of you? Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, today we have Alex Harvey, and he is down in Mississippi and... We wanted to have Alex on for a couple different reasons. He, we were just talking about this kind of pre-show. He really has connected this intersection between his background and his personal life and his professional life. And he's mm. just doing everything as far as like taking care of habitat, advocating for hunters, mm-hmm. all kinds of good stuff. And we just mm. really wanted to talk to him. And um, once, once I met him in person, I was like, man, we got to have this guy on the podcast. Yeah. So here we are finally doing it. Yeah. And thank you, Alex. I'm going to tell folks about you a little, and then we'll jump in. So 
Alex is the consulting forester and wildlife biologist, and he's president of his company called Legacy Land Management LLC. And it's one of the very few African-American owned natural resource management firms in the entire country. And he has a long education that led him there. He has a Bachelor of Science in Forestry and Wildlife Management uh, from Mississippi State University's College of Forest Resources. He also uh, has leadership development work in the Society of American Foresters Natural National Leadership Academy uh, and, and multiple other different kind of leadership and forestry background type of things. Uh, and then I should also tell you, he, he's been doing this for quite a while and he works with all kinds of folks in the state and federal government, universities, nonprofits, and, and, and works really with this diverse background in forest management, wildlife management, natural resource management, policy, all kinds of different things. And uh, it brought him here to this moment. And so we're happy about that. And we'll get in a little bit more to his background because it's, it's so distinguished and long, it's hard to, to do it justice there in the beginning. But uh, first, uh, we'll start with what, we, what we've been doing outside because we like to do that. So we'll, yeah. we'll let you start this time, Alex, and then we'll, and then we'll jump over to Bill and I. Oh, man. So, so I, um, I, I was recently rabbit hunting, uh, a little bit of quail hunting over in central and south Georgia. And, um, oh, yeah, you know, we saw I, some good pictures, too. Yeah, yeah man, thanks for that. Yes, of course. I, um, you know, rabbit hunting has such a uh, uh, such a long history in my family. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, we, we can go on and on about how much I enjoyed this, uh, this, this recent experience I had and um, how much it sort of connected me back to stories that I remember growing up from my, my mom's family, my dad's family and, and, and everyone in between in my community. So, you know, but, but rabbit hunting and quail hunting has kind of been, you know, it's the, the last thing I did outside. That sounds awesome. How about you, Big Bill? We will get into that too, Alex, because uh, I think, that, again, so many things intertwined there. I, 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 I'm going to ask if he started a kennel for his pack of beagles that he's <laughs> going to go ahead and pick up. I so, have not yet. <laughs> uh, I actually spent the weekend on the shores of beautiful Kentucky Lake replacing the axle on a boat trailer. So I was outside, <laughs> part of it in a sleet storm. Um, and, and I don't know if you've ever replaced the axle on a trailer, a boat trailer that's had it on it for 25 years. It's not fun. <laughs> no, it's not Down fun there's at humidity all. with some rust and all the good oh, stuff. Yeah. yeah. The good part of it was the lake is so high and muddy that it wasn't even tempting to go fish. So oh, I got my there work you done. go. Hmm. What about you, man? What have you been doing? Well, I, I spent the weekend doing something kind of odd, um, outside. I I've been dealing with a, the neck issue that's like pinching a nerve in my neck, you know, mm. and it's been getting better. And, and every year I go on a trip with for 20 plus years now, the group of old buddies in the middle of winter, we do a backpacking trip and uh, it's this coming weekend. Right. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to cut it and I'm trying to figure out. So I put a 40 pound sack of brand new dog food <laughs> and a few other things in a backpack and went trudging up a drainage did about three or four miles off, off trail just to see how it would go because I've been pretty nervous. Did okay. Slept okay that night. Not so much last night, but uh, I'm moving towards it. I think I'm just going to deal with whatever pain comes because it's it's just really not worth missing. But uh, not the typical outdoor adventure, but but still was a good time and, and always good to learn from the outdoors. They'll teach you stuff. So <laughs> anyway... Uh, Let's dive in a little bit, Alex. I think one of the things we we really wanted to to unpack, as we said, is you know your personal background, your sporting mm-hmm. history, mm-hmm. and how that kind of led you to where you are. I've heard you talk on a couple different other podcasts. I've heard mm-hmm. you a couple different mediums. You've got this fascinating story, and I think one of the myths that I love to hear you dispel, right, is like that you know that the hunting and fishing and so on hasn't been traditionally something that black folks partake in. Right. Right. Uh, we know that not to be true, but you right. know, I think that's a narrative that that's out mm-hmm. there sometimes. And mm-hmm. you're one of the best I've ever heard talk about that. And I, yeah. I'll just preface that this first question with that in that, you know, just, just throw us your personal background where you grew yeah. up, your connection to the outdoors, those kinds of things. Okay. So, um, 
I'm from uh, a mixture of central Mississippi as well as uh, kind of uh, uh, north central Mississippi. My, my parents uh, moved to the Mississippi Hill Country uh, back in the late 60s as student teachers, and they kind of never left. But um, my, my mom and dad were from down around Jackson, Mississippi, Hines County. So uh, between there and, you know, the, the Delta and the hills of Holmes County um, is kind of where I grew up. And um, my parents, uh, my parents had a cattle cattle farm. And we, so we cattle farmed and row cropped and all of that uh, growing up. And then uh, my dad was also a part of a hunting club um, up there in the hill country in the Delta. So I kind of grew up between all of those experiences and, and all of those places with a whole bunch of Mississippi co- culture mixed in, you know? Yeah. I love it. Cause that really sounds a lot like my upbringing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, growing up in the country, mm-hmm. everybody hunted and fished. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if I, you and I look a little different, uh, yeah. yeah, but like when I'd go rabbit hunting mm-hmm. and, and that's yeah. traditionally been a very, it, it was very much uh, uh, among, uh, in the black culture mm-hmm. in my region. Mm-hmm. I mean, tons of rabbit hunters. Yes. So if I yeah. was rabbit hunting, mm-hmm. I was the one that looked a little different a lot of right. times right. because, you know, I'm right. going with a bunch of black dudes. That's and, right. Uh, I was a little white guy. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of weird how that's changed over yeah. the years. And, yeah. and uh, it mm-hmm. seems to be maybe moving in the right direction again, but, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm interested to hear you expound on that. Yeah. So, as we move on. Um, you know, I, so for me, so I, I grew up, um, so my mom's father was a, was a pastor and, uh, and a bird hunter and, and also was really big into rabbit hunting. And then, um, my dad's folks were were largely uh, rabbit hunters and small game, you know. And um, and then when I came along, like I said, my dad uh, joined a, a hunting club up in the Mississippi Hill Country where deer were very prevalent up there. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, I kind of really got into deer hunting until much later. And um, you know, but I always grew up with these stories of of rabbit hunting being. And, 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 and quail hunting uh, being so um, beloved and so common within uh, within the the community, you know, that I grew up. And, um, you know, I, I was just recently relaying a story. So uh, my, my grandmother, whom I lost in 2002, my dad's mom, um, she I can remember I was very young, but she would always tell this story about uh, when she first got married to my granddad and uh one day she was she was with my my great grandmother, um, who was my, my grandfather's mom, and my grandfather's mom noticed there was a rabbit on the farm, and so she uh, she uh, took a pistol and, and shoved it into my my grandmother's hand and said, you know, go shoot that rabbit, right? And so my grandmother ended up, <laughs> you know, having to pursue this rabbit for a while, but but she she did shoot it, and she always told that story so so joyously. Um, and even, you know, I, just this past uh, just this past weekend or so, I was, you know, sitting down with a couple of uncles on, on both sides of the family who are who are very accomplished uh, rabbit hunters in their own right. And, uh, you know, they were sharing stories uh, of, of having rabbit hunted with my dad. Now, I, I, I lost my dad when I was a student at Mississippi State. And so, you know, we, we actually never rabbit hunted together, my dad and I, but he loved it. He loved it. And um you know, and, and so what's interesting about that is because I've always spent the majority of my life really, you know, pursuing deer and, and, and other things, um, you know, to kind of to kind of come back to rabbit hunting now. And, you know, and immediately for me, I mean, uh, you know, I, of course, I've, you know, I've shot a few rabbits here and there, but just never really sort of got into the whole the whole thing of it all. And. Um, the, a recent experience that I had, uh, it, so, it sort of really changed something for me in, in the most profound way, simply because um, I recognized something that um, that has sort of kind of always been there. You know, I, I hunted with six guys that I'd never met before. They were all much older than me. And, um, you know, within that, that uh, experience, 
where, I mean, they were, they were very kind. They were very nice when I got there, but it was just sort of, you know, handshaking and, you know, let's let the dogs out and let's walk them to the woods. And after we had hunted for a while and I, I got a rabbit and, and sort of, you know, everybody sort of kind of to, to, to kind of mold together and have conversations and, and, um, and I really recognized the sort of cadence and rhythm of all those experiences that I'd had growing up where, um, you know, uh, the banter, the conversations, the chatter, the laughter, you know, the love, the love that everyone had for each other, um, you know, given this experience and even even the reverence of the experience, you know, of of, uh, of nature sort of pressing down on you as you're pursuing these rabbits. Right. Um, and, and so to how that humanizes everybody. And so. Um, I, you know, I, I can't, I can't say enough about what this experience has sort of done for me in the way that, um, you know, I, I kind of, I, I really wish that I would have had, had that experience with my dad. Um, but I also am all, you know, I feel very connected and, and really even very excited, um, simply because, you know, um, I, again, I recognize the, um, the the tone and the rituals of a culture that I remember growing up as a kid that has, in by you know by and large, um, unfortunately vanished in many ways. And so, um, yeah, man, it, it was it was a it was a wonderful experience. I, I really enjoyed it. So, but you're here to keep it alive. That's the I good am. News. I am definitely here to keep it alive. I, I will say, um. Yes, this is this is subject matter that is definitely very, very important to me um, and, and for so many reasons. Um, and, and, you know, everything I do, as you pointed out, is sort of interconnected. I, I um, I'm a country kid. I grew up on a farm. You know, I sort of grew up in these pretty rural communities where, by and large, yes, everybody was African-American. Everybody was outdoorsy. Everybody was, you know, um, um, really connected to nature in a way that that um, that I think is is oftentimes of you know and, and as well as historically sort of been overlooked right and um, and and so you know I am always I guess you know very eager to talk about those experiences that I had growing up as a kid and how um, these experiences in many ways are what it means, I guess, for me is, you know, profoundly African-American experiences, you know, because if you are African-American, then the likelihood is that your parents or grandparents or someone, someone came from the American South. Right. And and um, and there is a lot to be said about, um, you know, how that history um you know, has has for for a number of reasons vanished and how there's now this sort of uh, renaissance taking place of of people getting back to it. Right. And um, yeah, that that's the beauty of it all. You know, let's peel back that, the the layers of that onion a little bit more, because I know mm-hmm. when when we've talked before, Alex, you know, you've talked about kind of multi-generational you have stories about your grandparents mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and maybe they even had stories about their parents, you know, mm-hmm. like, like tell, tell that story, like bring us from, you know, what your grandparents were experiencing to what brought you. And then, you know, I don't know if there's a good way to answer this one because, but it's a, it's a unique question that I have kind of based on what you just said. You know, I feel like when I talk to you, there's this, um, I don't even know the right word, but you know, this way that like everything you do kind of circles itself mm-hmm. and reinforces that like you're on the right path with what you're doing, you know, and you keep getting yeah. these constant reminders from like yeah. your background yeah. and your history and mm-hmm. where your path's leading now. And, you know, maybe, maybe yeah. there's something in that that you can talk about too. Yeah. So I think, man, that, that's a, that's a wonderful question. So I, I do think there's a sort of chronology you know, in terms of generational experiences and, and how they are connected, right? In, in terms of like things that I, I learned from my dad and, you know, I, I um, you know, my, my, I have an older brother who's 10 years older than me, can relay more experiences about my grandfather um, whom I never met or all of those things. But I've always, absolutely always had a sense of connectedness to, um, to you know, previous generations in, in terms of like... Uh, stories that my dad, you know, told me, or even, even just feeling a sense of presence when you're walking around the family farm, you know, something as simple as that. Right. 
Um, but I think that, you know, my, um, you know, my dad would oftentimes talk about, um, you know, what it meant growing up and, and how they, they really uh, depended on, you know, wild game as a, as a means of subsistence. Right. And so, um, and, and he was a very passionate hunter, you know, and, and, um, I was also, again, I was very fortunate to, uh, to go to his, you know, his hunting club and, and get to know all the men that were, that were also a part of that. And, and, and many of them are, uh, you know, became much like fathers as well. And, um, and all of those experiences of man, I, I think the best way to express, uh, excuse me, to explain it is a sort of, uh, a sort of mysticism in a way with their, with how they, uh, how they feel, you know, how they are connected to nature and they sort of pass along that narrative. Um, you know, um, of course, a lot of the history of the African-American experience in terms of land and our relationship with land is not very good, you know, but um, for what it's worth, even beyond all of that, um, is in communities that I go to today and uh, that I work in today um, and in, you know, the communities that I remember growing up as a kid, there was always a sense of love and, 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 and admiration and pride in the relationship that everyone had with the land. And, you know, even if we were just, you know, we were just sort of recreating, sitting around and, 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 you know, laughing and having jokes or, if we were working on the farm or, or what have you. And, um, you know, I, I think all of those experiences, uh, for what it's worth, you know, they reflect, you know, not only, you know, just the, the basic elements of the human experience, but they also reflect a deeper complexity in terms of what it means to to be African American within this narrative of the American South, or within this narrative of what it means to be American and connected to nature and all of that. And so, um, yeah, I feel like I can ramble on about these things for hours simply because of what I, you know, uh, my my passion for these things. Um, but I, you know, I would say, you know, you know, given you know this uh, wonderful opportunity that I get every day to live and 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 uh, sort of make an impact um, in terms of conservation, working in these communities, talking about forest management issues or wildlife management issues, or helping these families understand uh, that their land is an asset and how to leverage and access that asset in terms of creating better wildlife habitat and relationships with you know folks who are looking for hunting leases or if it's working within uh, municipalities, within, you know, uh, you know, with elected officials and so forth, um, talking about these things in, in, in terms of, of their value, these green spaces to, to, you know, small towns and larger cities and all of that, you know, um, you know, these things are in many ways, they're sort of, uh, they're sort of endless, but they are all our story. You know, you can't, I'd say, you know, you can't, you sort of can't crank up your car and go from home to your office or, or from one place to another without uh, having a sense of, uh, a sense of connectedness to green spaces. Even if you're just looking out of the window and you're, you're enjoying that, or if you are somebody who are from an area and you have stories to tell about people you've known and things you remember growing up or what have you, you know, we, we all... Uh, for what it's worth, have this sense of, uh, you know, identity with with nature, right? You know, it's uh, uh, just occurred to me, Theodore Roosevelt, who, you know, most mm-hmm. of us is sportsman, he's kind of an mm-hmm. icon. He had said once the greatest hunter he ever met was an African-American mm-hmm. bear hunter from the Mississippi Delta. His name was Hope so, Collier. Uh, yes, indeed. That's and, right. um, you that's know, right. that's, that's somebody that, um, you know, I, I have a, a good friend of mine who insists that, you know, that Hope Collier is in his family, you know, line. Um, but I, you know, I would say, and you know, this is something that, again, I get, I get really passionate about Bill because um, I, I, you know, I watch hunting shows, you know, from time to time and, you know, I see the fact that a lot of people, you know, have done really well financially with just, you know, creating content. 
but I can absolutely tell you that, you know, uh, some of the men that, that raised me that were a part of my dad's hunting club was some of the, the, the very best outdoorsmen, you know, that I've, that I've seen. Um, I'm a forester. I'm a wildlife biologist. I've been all over the country. I've met a lot of people. Um, I've met a lot of very well-educated people and all of that. Um, but, but I can, I can honestly say to you that, um, the sense of ethics, uh, the sense of value, the sense of connectedness, um, the reverence for the pursuit of game, the reason why we hunt, all of those things, um, are very much intact in many ways in the African-American community of the rural South. And, um, you know, I, I, um, yeah, I, I I feel really strongly about that, and and you know I, you know you know for yes you know the 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 notion that Hope Kai was perhaps one of the best um, to ever do it comparable to Daniel Boone. I've heard a lot of people say, which which I'm sure was probably the case. Um, uh, but I would also say that there there are average ordinary guys right now who are walking around who are some of the very best outdoorsmen that that the world has never heard of, um, and um, you know, that's something that I think we need to work on because, you know, the future of hunting is profoundly important to all of us. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times, you know, the narrative becomes, you know, hunting is this, this really horrible thing that it isn't. And um, I think the more we engage, you know, diverse communities within this conversation of their experiences and their stories and, and allowing them to put their stories and experiences out there, um, then we find a broader coalition of people who are, who are in fact very, you know, very uh, passionate about it and, and are advocates. And, and that's certainly what we need, you know. Let's get to that a little later because I know like your work with HOC and, and some of the other folks there I, I want to talk about too. But maybe let's talk a little bit more distinctly about um, your professional work because you have this, mm-hmm. this great business out there improving habitat. Mm-hmm. You know, just just give us a day in the life. What, okay. are you, what are you working on? How how you? What kind of projects you got going? What are your yeah. What are your goals right now? Man, I, I've got so many things going on right now, from timber sales to prescribed burning to you know uh, habitat management plans and uh, some environmental work uh, on specific things with utility companies and, and the like. So there's a lot happening. You know, I, I think for me, in order to talk about the, the work that I do now, it's always important for me to kind of take a step back and talk about the, the way that I got here. And, um, you know, I, I worked for, of course, uh, out of college, I worked for the U S forest service for about six or seven years, um, on the Allegheny national forest up in Northwest of Pennsylvania. And, and I, I really just got tired of those winters. <laughs> okay. And I, I wanted to get out of there. So, um, you know, I, I managed to find my way back South and, um, I heard about this, this sort of groundbreaking work that was taking place, uh, with some nonprofit organizations that was really new working with the African American farmers, families, landowners, um, in, in three target areas at the time it was Alabama, South Carolina and North Carolina. And that was at the time it was called the African American Sustainable Forestry and Land Retention Program. And it was kind of spearheaded by this philanthropy called the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. And and I heard about this work and uh, there was a a nonprofit in Alabama that was doing it called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And so I I applied for that position. I was fortunate enough to get it. And then um, when I got it, you know, it sort of it sort of brought all of this stuff home to me. So all of the 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 book learning, if you will, that I learned at Mississippi State and with the Forest Service about about, you know, forestry and, and wildlife management and all these, you know, really sort of, uh, you know, academic things, you know, to be able to apply them in communities that people look just like me and. I could totally understand their perspectives and their history and and all these things. And so I did that work for about three and a half years, helping to develop and pilot what is now called the Sustainable Forestry and Land Retention Program for African-Americans. And um, after that time, I decided that I I thought the most impact that I could make in these communities was um, was to become a private consultant. And so I um, I wanted to step away and, and start my own company. Um, for a number of reasons. One, uh, the issue of timber sales is it just looms profoundly large 
in in rural communities. And, you know, the selling of timber is just really actually very complicated thing. And most people don't understand how this whole thing works. And when you get to minority communities where there's a common theme of lack of access to information, then um, these communities get taken advantage of a great deal. And one of the things that the U.S. endowment did during that time was they brought in a team of researchers to sort of uh, profile these landowners to, to understand why they did not hire professional consultants and natural resource professionals to help them manage their assets in terms of their land. And so I, um, I decided that, you know, based on that, because one of the things that came out of that was they did not see people that looked like them who were in the ranks of consultancy. Right. And so, so I thought, well, if representation matters, then it's time to take a faithful step and actually get out there in a way where, you know, I can I can do something that I'm passionate about. I can still be an advocate uh, for the folks and communities that I that I represent and care about, and um, I can make an impact in terms of, of in terms of conservation and hunting and and all of those things. And so that's why I started Legacy Land Management back in 2017, and. Um, you know, from there, uh, via a number of partnerships with the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, um, Southern Forestry Consultants and Wiregrass Ecological out of Bainbridge, Georgia, and um, and others. You know, over the last several years, I've just, you know, I've sort of been developing uh, the brand of legacy and, and, and what all that means in, in terms of working within these communities. So, yeah, so I, so I, you know, I just really worked at sort of developing that brand Um and, you know, and, and, and beginning the process of sort of, uh, you know, furthering the information and education exchange that needs to take place within these communities for for folks to sort of understand that there have for a long time been systems in place to, you know, to access uh, the wealth that is already in your control in terms of the forest land that you own. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I um you know, I'm really excited. I, I love, I love forestry. I, I love natural resources management, and I love you know thinking about all these things and and being able to sort of be one of the uh, few faces that look like mine in a community that is that has sort of always been out there in terms of consulting foresters and wildlife biologists and so forth. Um, but I, I will say that one of the you know the greatest things that we face as a nation is the reality that. You know, you know, uh, we are we're rapidly changing in terms of diversity and, you know, you know, in terms of, you know, the profession of forestry and, and wildlife management and all those things, as you know, all, all this stuff connects back to hunting. But, you know, if, if we are to be viable in the future, you know, it's it's, you know, critically important that there are diverse voices in the room who sometimes push back on. Maybe, you know, the way that we've, quote unquote, always done things. Right. And it's not that the intent of why we've always done things is bad. Sometimes it's just not necessarily very well informed. And so or it doesn't take into account, you know, somebody else's experiences or or uh, all of that. And so, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's very energizing, man, day in and day out, you know, um, to to pursue the opportunity to just, you know, to try to make a make an impact day in and day out and working with folks and and representing them and, and giving them, you know, um, information where there has not been that sort of information there before. That's good stuff. And, I, you know, anyone who spends a lot of time in the rural south knows family farms and, mm-hmm. and small farms in general are they're dying fast. Yes, and it's fast. obviously yeah. a big challenge. Yeah. And you've already identified one issue for African-American mm-hmm. landowners. I mean, let's face it, when we're looking for someone to trust, Mm -hmm. we've had our parents, we've Mm -hmm. had our preachers. Mm -hmm. Generally, those are people that look kind of like us. So so I get that. What are are there some other unique challenges for the African-American landowners in the South? Yeah, the issue of heirs property. Right. And that's where, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, African-Americans have not always been able to trust the legal system um, in in many ways. And so. um, you know, uh, it was believed for generations that if you if you passed away and you didn't leave a will, that this sort of uh, 
you know, encumbered the property so that it would never be lost into families, right? That families would always have control of it. And that's actually the exact opposite. That is the number one cause of land loss, right? Is when someone passes away and they don't, that they don't leave the will. And it also, um, you know, it, it locks people out of the opportunity to pursue this sort of wealth creating mechanism of, of USDA conservation programs and and other opportunities. And so, you know, literally what it does is it, you know, the legal system is sort of like who who actually owns it. You know, so you have people who, you know, their grandparents and their great grandparents and every generation that, that anyone can remember grew up on a, on a piece of property. And, you know, um, there may be, uh, you know, there, I, I've worked with families where there were 60 owners to 30 acres, you know, and that makes that basically renders a piece of property valueless in many ways, because there's no way you're going to get 60 people to agree on one thing. Right. Um, and. So, so there, there are a number of really complicated issues. And, and you know, for what it's worth, I think that, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of perception also that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these experiences, I mean, a lot of these avenues are not necessarily very welcoming uh, in terms of working with African-American communities as well. And I, I spent a lot, a lot of my time, uh, you know, uh, trying to be the bridge there to say, you know, you know, there is a definite system for how this happens and it looks after your interests and, you know, here is how you get it done. And, um, you know, so, so, so great question. Cause there, there are a number of things that, you know, that are sort of nuanced and very complicated. And, you know, if you are from the American South, I mean, you're, you're probably, um, pretty well acquainted with, uh, um, the nuances of Southern life. Right. And, and what all that means. So, so yeah. I'm not well acquainted. I see you guys shaking your heads and I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but when I come down, I sure enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Alex, what about, you know, you, you talked about some of the challenges and so on, but are you seeing it getting better? And I mean, a lot of the work you're doing is, is the kind of thing that makes it better, right? You're, yeah. you're kind of greasing the skids. You're giving people information. You're helping do projects. Yeah. That's one question. I got another one for you right after that because okay. I, I think it's going to lead good to some of yeah. the sporting stuff too. Yeah, I, I definitely think that there that that change is happening, man. Um, and it, it's it's quite a thing to see, you know. Um, whereas, you know, one of the things that I do is I work with um, African American families that sometimes, for the most part, they don't even live in the same state as their land, right? And so, you know, they're they're looking for partners, if you will, to help them, you know. You know, turn that land into a better asset, and a lot of times that turns out being lease holders who are interested in hunting. And so, whereas you take these lands that have not at all, for what it's worth, had conservation practices implemented at least in the last sixty years, you know, um, because our pan our past land use practices in many ways were actually conservation practices. <laughs> it, it, you know, in the, in the past. But, you know, a lot of these lands have not really had conservation implements. So what we're doing is actually creating healthier habitat for wildlife. And um, and what's funny about that is the bridges that come out of that in terms of uh, people who are from rural African-American communities who um, have not necessarily uh felt that those communities even were welcoming or friendly. And so when, when I connect, for instance, you know, a, a, a white guy who is a, you know, a, a hunter who uh, just wants to, to lease a nice place that he's going to take care of and only he and his, you know, son or daughter or whomever will hunt. And he has that same level of, of investment in terms of working with this African-American family because he he also wants to maintain his relationship there in that family. I mean, it, it has a very transformative effect. Not only does it transform the relationship between those partners, but it, it, it ultimately trans transforms those communities because they start generating revenue in, in ways that, you know, that they had not probably seen before. And um, and it has an overall positive effect in terms of how people perceive each other, you know, and and what we perceive each other's interest to be in terms of how we communicate. Right. So yeah. I love that because I'm always telling the story of how hunting and being out on the land is a connective thing. Yeah. 
Mm. Right? A lot of people are like, oh, if I can't do it, then, you know, maybe uh, it would separate me away. But it's like one time you come along and all of a sudden you're part of this community and, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of mm -hmm. start building towards it. Howdy, listeners. For more great content, check out NWF Outdoors social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Connect with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas for podcast guests and questions in the comments. And for even more excellent content, here's a message from our partner podcast. Hey everyone, this is Marsha Brownlee from Artemis Sports Women. We know you love awesome stories about hunting, fishing, and conservation. So head on over to the Artemis Podcast. You'll meet adventurous, accomplished women who are redefining conservation through their lives in the field and on the water. Filled with humor, audacity, empathy, and intelligence, Artemis brings you new voices and introduces you to women from all walks of the sporting community. Find Artemis wherever you get your podcasts. I've got a little bit of forestry in my background. Sometimes I walk in the forest and I think, you know, I got it all figured out. They just need to do a little this over here and all of that over there. I start prescribing in my mind, you know, like, here's what you could do to really take care of this place and hook it up. And I wonder, you know, you probably can, you probably do that all the time, right? You you hit these pieces of land and you're like, oh, if you're trying to do some quail stuff, you got this mm -hmm. and some whitetail. I mean, is yeah. that is that how you feel when you get out to land? You know, how, I, I, I how can't turn that? that thing off, man. I can't turn that yeah. thing off. I mean, day in and day out, I'm riding down the road with my, my wife and daughter or whomever, and I'm thinking about, you know, uh, prescribing something or another, you know, to a piece of property that I see. Um so I, I I do it very often, and um, Forester's curse, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. And so you know, it's uh, you know, it's 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 that thing that I think though that um, I don't know. I I kind of see you know me as as sort of uh, you know I'm just doing work that's that's broader than me, man. Things that are that are far, you know, that'll go and live, you know, way beyond my time here. And, um, and so, you know, when I'm doing that, I, I guess I just see it as kind of practicing. It's constant practice for the next case, the next opportunity, the next family, the next, you know, whatever that is. Um, but yeah, you know, and then, you know, um, you know, the thing that sort of comes along with that is, you know, if, you know, in the, you know, if you're a forester, you know, then, you know, you, you can get, you know, 10 foresters together and, you know, we can, you know, you'll probably have 10 different opinions on how to do something <laughs> because we don't oftentimes always agree on the same way to do things. But, um, but, but yes, it is, uh, it's something that I do constantly. And, um, I, I feel, um, I feel a sense of connect, you know, I, oftentimes, um, you know, some of my colleagues, they have to remind me, you know, Alex, you're, you're, you get, you got to pull back. You're too emotionally invested in this, you know, this particular issue or that, you know, this kind of thing, like, you know, cause, cause I, I do have lots of frustrations when I'm trying to, trying to help people and trying to move them forward and things are not necessarily going as I would hope. And, um, you know, that is, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess the, the long and the short of it is I just take this thing seriously, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, don't let them take that uh, that passion out of you. That's the good stuff. <laughs> let me let me ask you one thing, and I'll maybe I'll quit rambling and let Bill talk a little bit more here. But uh, so you know all this all this background, and and I guess something else that that I recognized when you were talking because you said it, you said the words legacy, right? And mm -hmm. you also talked about mysticism around mm -hmm. this and how this all. But really, legacy is probably the right word to define it, yeah. right? It's like yeah. you come from it, you're mm -hmm. you're creating it. It's kind of what the sporting conservation mm -hmm. ethos should be about. It's kind of like yeah. our history. Yeah. And, and if we're doing a good job, we're carrying that forward, right? That's because right. That's that's, right. that's really us. We we yeah. want this thing to be something mm -hmm. that's always there. We mm -hmm. want it like I, I can dream of years from now when our grandkids are out there hunting, right? And we're dead and mm -hmm. gone. But mm -hmm. we need to know that that's true. We need to that's know right. that our, our work made that happen or else mm -hmm. then it's all over, right? If we can't that's imagine right. that moment that's in the right. future. but. Anyway, I think that kind of helped me pin that after mm -hmm. you were talking there. But let's yeah. connect that professional work with 
the sporting conservation advocacy you've been getting mm -hmm. into because mm -hmm. or, or you probably have been for a while. It's more just hit my radar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you work with HOC, Hunters of Color. Yes. Yeah, some of the other work you've been there. doing. Yeah. yeah t just yeah. talk about how you, you know, what was your first kind of dive into that and then how it's progressed? Um, so, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I kind of connected with, with Hunters of Color very fortuitously. Uh, I, I, um, I was invited uh, last year, I think it was May maybe, I, I went up to Northeastern Oklahoma and went turkey hunting with a group called Hunt to Eat. You know, they invited me to come up and mentor some other hunters and it, it was great. And so um, I met a young lady there that was good friends with uh, the founders of, of Hunters of Color. And so we just, you know, we just somehow hit it off and, and she was like, oh, you need to, you know, you need to meet these folks. And so I, you know, I met and, very, very quickly, I could tell that we had a lot in common in terms of, you know, passions and, and synergies and, and all of that. And so, you know, I, I said, hey, you know, uh, you know, do you guys, you know, are you looking for somebody to be on your board? I asked them and they said, oh, yes, we would love you. Have. <laughs> you know, so so um, so I immediately just kind of uh, kind of got right into it and um, and started, you know, working here, uh, you know, in the South around, you know, how to develop, you know, uh, you know, programs and things like that for, for hunters of color, but also some of the broader issues that, you know, the organization is, is sort of developing. And, um, you know, and that, that has been, uh, it's been very, uh, fulfilling, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the sort of really broad, diverse organization that, that Hunters of Color is and a lot of its partnerships with, with other organizations as well. Um, again, you know, you, you really see this, this wonderful renaissance taking place of young people who are, who are sort of discovering what it means to be conservationists and to be hunters and outdoors people and, and why all of that's important and why it isn't, of course, about just, quote unquote, murdering something and and all of that and, and how hunting is literally at the very core of food culture and not necessarily that of, of gun culture, if you will. Right. And so, um, you know, that that whole experience, man, has been it's been great. Just just meeting people from from all over the place. Many of them are much younger than I am, um, but sort of. Uh, you know, came to this in some way, you know, from either either just a, a, a driven sense of this is something that I want to do or stories that they heard from their own families, you know. And, you know, I, I think that, uh, again, those things are the they're, they're the most powerful when you have a story that you can connect to your legacy. And that word is, of course, very important for me, um, which is why I named my company Legacy. But um, but when you have a story that you can connect to your legacy and you pass that story on, I don't think there's anything more important, if you will, in terms of your past and your future than when you can then when you can identify your experience right now with that of people before you and and pass that along into the future to people that come after you. And and I don't know anything, man, that uh, that sort of brings the circle of life home more than hunting. You know, um, I, I don't think there is anything. You know, I, I um, again, you know, uh, growing up hunting on my dad's hunting club, you know, and I, I really have always sort of had this impression that um, that the folks that were members of that had a totally different kind of understanding, if you will, on what, you know, what life and death was and um, have sort of always seen that in, in, in a in a lens that was uh, different. It was very complicated in a way, but it was also, you know, there was also a quietness to it all that that was that was ever present. And um you know, it, it's something that, uh, you know, I, I just hope I, I get to pursue it, you know, and, and you know, until I, I can't go any further because, um, 
it has been, you know, just just the stories alone. Like this this past year, I was invited to go out to uh, Nebraska and and go uh, mule deer hunting and out there. And uh, my brother and I, we had not been in the woods. Our brother is 10 years older than me. And we had not been in the woods together in almost 15 years uh, just because of life. Right. And so several things happened. For one, I remember growing up as a kid, always sort of being in my brother's shadow. Right. Sort of being in his silhouette when we were when we were doing anything around the farm or we were walking or whatever. And I had not. <laughs> You know, I had not uh, I had not been in his silhouette in that way in years until we were walking three miles in to set up a ground blind, you know, to, you know. And so that, that was this thing that took place then. And then, um, you know, on that trip, unfortunately, I, I got word that I lost my mother in law. And so we had to you know, we had to we had to cut short. Um and I, I know I'm kind of getting deep here, but this is what hunting is for me. You know, it's 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 my story. You know, um, it's the angst of uh, of thinking about you know uh, the call that I got. Hey, you know, things are not looking good. We, we need you know need you to come home. And um, you know, it's it's sort of that that entire narrative. It's it's the wondering or the 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 feeling of, I wish my dad could see my brother and I riding through Western Kansas and Nebraska. You know, I wish he could have saw that, you know, those two mule deer doe that just came, you know, I wish that he could have experienced. That is a part of my story, you know? Um, and and it, again, it's, it's not something that I at all take, uh, take lightly. I mean, that, that's what, that's what hunting has always been for me. You know, it's it's right. the constant day to day intertwined with my love of nature and my pursuit to uh, to, to go and and get some food for the table that we're going to make and put our whole hearts into and sit around as a group and absolutely love each other together with it. You know, so um yeah, I, you know. Sorry, I can't. No, I can't get no, it. that's yeah. good. That's good. That, you know, one thing I noticed when I we talked earlier when I was in school around here, it was nothing to see African American hunters. I mean, it was a common thing yeah. in the country. Yeah. When I came back, and now we all lived in the country. When I came back from college, most of those houses were gone, um, both white and black. Mm -hmm. You know the farming had changed people had moved to cities and the next thing you know you lose a generation mm -hmm. and you never get them back mm -hmm. in the field i mm -hmm. mean we've seen that all over the map yeah. um and knowing that it is a very difficult sport not necessarily difficult but it's an intimidating sport to try to mm -hmm. jump into on your own mm -hmm. a lot of people would love to do it when you talk to them they just don't know how and right. intimidated but and hunters are, can be intimidating yes, people. Course. I mean, yeah. when I go to Arkansas, mm -hmm. duck hunting to public areas, mm -hmm. as long as they don't see my plates, I'm fine. <laughs> but when they see my license plate yeah. or the numbers on my boat, mm -hmm. I will have people mm -hmm. being yeah, jerks. pretty, pretty yeah. ugly. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's just a small taste, yeah. I think, of probably what African Americans can mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. in the field. Yes, of um, course. I, I think, you know, you just illustrated something that I think is so complicated because sometimes, you know, being an African American man, I, you know, if if I encounter somebody who's being a jerk out outdoors, my first thought is probably not that he's just naturally a jerk. My first thought is he probably has an issue with my race, right? And that is where our perceptions and our experiences, unfortunately, you know, um, if you will, they, they kind of get in the way of, you know, uh, connecting with other humans. Now, you know, I, I've said this on a number of podcasts and I, and I feel passionate about it, but hunters, I think we have to be the ones to sort of, to sort of regulate, you know, um, those jerks among us and make them feel not welcome. And, um, you know, and, and let them know that we're, you know, we're just, we're better than that. And we, we won't continue to accept that kind of thing, but you know um, yeah. Hunting, hunting itself, man. I mean, 
you know, just think about it. You're, you're outside and it's, you know, it's 25 degrees, and it's 30 degrees. And, you know, you're, you, you know, if you're, if you're rabbit hunting, you're walking. If you, if you're, if you're deer hunting, you're sitting still. Um, you know, the, the, the human part of all that is, is what nature is doing to you at that moment. You're freezing <laughs> or you're tired, right? You're, you're, you know, what it, whatever it is. And yes, it, it can absolutely, uh, you know, hunting itself can just take you apart. And that is, you know, that's, that's a part of it all, you know, is, is, uh, um, the discipline that it takes to learn to endure and withstand that experience and then excel, right. Um, to continue to pursue that. And I, you know, um, yeah, that's, you know, I, it's something that I, I feel really passionate about where we always, Bill, we have to have conversations with people who look much different than us and think much differently than us. And we also have to be patient with each other in terms of, um, you know, those conversations that we have. And, and, and then we also have to have empathy with each other too, you know, um, whereas understanding that, um, first and foremost, we're all having a human experience, but we're also within that experience having complicated social things or whatever they are, you know, um, to inform that experience that, that could be, uh, negative for, for some or, or what have you. And so, um, you know, again, there's there's so many layers that you have to peel back in terms of of identifying with folks and and trying to understand, you know, where they come from. I, I've hunted a lot of different places. Um, most of the places I've ever been, I've I've been made to feel welcome, or you know, I've just been kind of left alone. Um, but I I do, you know, I, I have been a few places where, you know, it was made pretty clear that I, you know, that I was not going to be made to feel welcome, unfortunately. And, um, and, you know, I, I, um, for what it's worth that, you know, I, I, I come from a pretty strong family background where, you know, I, I've, I've received a lot of love. And so I know who I am. I don't really worry about that, you know? Um, but I, but I would also say, you know, I, I don't ever want to see anybody, literally no one who is interested in hunting, um, be made to feel as if they are not welcome in nature. Nature, nature is nature. It belongs to everybody, you know? And, and so that, that is kind of where I, uh, I guess I, I get most fired up, you know, in terms of just making sure that, that everybody is at least allowed to, to experience and exist, um, in nature and, 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 and develop or what have you, you know, their own passions in the way that they uh, prefer. So, you know. Well, I got, I got two things cause I want to follow this vein, but first I was a little grumpy with you Southerners talking about 25, 30 degrees. It's really cold <laughs> outside. <laughs> right, five below yeah. or something and see how you do. But Man. anyway, okay, go ahead. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I, when you were talking about that, you know, on a more serious note, the, you know, the, the how hunters and sportsmen and women have led on so many of mm-hmm. these discussions mm-hmm. and when it comes to like wildlife conservation, right, have led and, 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 and kind of broached some of those thresholds that, that haven't been there. And I think this, this, you know, these race relations, this like, you know, mm-hmm. the, the narrative that maybe African-Americans haven't been involved in hunting and fishing as mm-hmm. much as they should we got to lead again. Right. And, yes. and you're doing it. And, and I think it, the beauty of it is we have this tool, this vehicle, the outdoors mm-hmm. to take us there. Right. Because we, we have an arena that's already so set for mm-hmm. that. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is so beautiful. And I love that. And, you know, yeah. uh, I, I'm glad you're on the, the HOC board. You know, we've, I've had Jimmy on this podcast mm-hmm. before and, um, mm-hmm. Marsha has had uh, our Artemis podcast had Lydia on. Okay, lots of good folks there. I've had Crystal on this okay. podcast. You okay, know, so yeah. lots of good folks in in those ranks, and so I'm glad you're there now too. Uh, you know, as we're getting closer to the end, Alex, I wanted to ask you too: Are you what are you working on down? You know, conservation wise, um, any advocacy things, anything else you want to share us from your region that our listeners should uh, should know about? Um. 
You know, there there are I, I just say there's a number of things and, and all of them are, are kind of loosely based based around uh, you know, improving habitat and improving access uh, you know, for for hunters uh, to places that are that are that are really important that we manage and you know, a big part of, you know, what I mean when I say managing is ensuring that that conservation dollars flow to these areas and ensuring that hunters and others um, are allowed the opportunity to to experience those things simply because you know we, we know how the North American wildlife model works right and and how those you know conservation dollars that hunters contribute um, you know tend to improve these overall green spaces and so that's a lot of the work that I'm doing. Um, you know, just in ensuring that that those things are, are always at the forefront of the conversations that we're having. You know, we got to get you connected up with Vanishing Paradise, as we said. That's a, yes. a good one. You'd be perfect for. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. We'll 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 do some good stuff together. Well, sounds we'll good. Do some good sounds stuff. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, good, Alex. Anything else you want to leave us with before we let you go back back about your busy life? Man, <laughs> I can't think of a single thing right off the bat. I just want to say thank you guys for for having me on your podcast, and uh, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, I look forward to you know potential working together with you guys on different things in the future. So, yes, sir, we appreciate it too. And uh, we're gonna have to do that uh, that hunt trade one of these days. He's uh, yeah. Bill. Bill Alex is bragging to me about you know whitetail Mississippi hill country whitetail hunting. So. I need to get in on that someday and get him That's out here it. for some elk or something. That's right. There Let's you go. do it. Let's do it, man. There you go. Let's do it. Y'all awesome. both come up here for some ducks. Oh, don't, don't. <laughs> I'll do it now. I love duck hunting. <laughs> if you invite me, I will show up, okay? Next January, come on up. I'll do it. I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah. Now, now, one thing we always do, we close the show out by everyone singing Rocky Top. Oh, no, definitely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> no man, hell state here. I am not singing that awful song. No, thank you. <laughs> well, we we got the we got the, the rivalry yeah. brewing right here on our podcast. Oh, I love it. Awesome, awesome, man. This is great. This is great. Thank you guys both, man. Well, well thanks, Alex, so much for all you're doing, and uh, we'll put links to uh, your company and Hunters of Color and anything else you want us to put on in our show notes. And absolutely, we'll see you next time down the trail, my man. Thank y'all so very much, man. Thank y'all. For more great content, check out NWF Outdoors social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Connect with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas for podcast guests and questions in the comments. We are NWF Outdoors.